Hi everybody, uh, this is lecture 16 and today I will uh, continue telling you about Green's theorem. Uh, so my goal for today is to illustrate the theorem uh, by relating it to things that you already know. So let's, uh, let's, let's get to it. So first, first thing to do is to re recall the statement of the theorem. Uh, so as I said last time, the Green's theorem is a, for is a combination of a formula and a picture. Right, so it says that if you integrate a vector field over a curve, and here I am denoting the vector field uh, by, by I'm denoting the line integral using component component notation, then the result of this integral over a closed curve is equal to the double integral over the region enclosed by the curve of a, a combination of the partials of the vector field. So the picture is that we have a curve C, uh, a closed curve C in the plane equipped with the positive orientation and we have a region D uh, that's enclosed by this curve and uh, the theorem tells us that if I do a line integral of a vector field around the closed curve then the result is the same as doing a double integral of, th of this combination of derivatives uh, on the inside, on the on the in region inside the curve, so you can go switch between a line integral and a double integral uh, when we have a closed curve in the plane. And, and there is the caveat then the that the vector field. So if you're just starting from the from the left hand side, you, you might uh, think that you only need the vector fields the, the function uh, functions p and q to be defined along this curve over here. But in fact, if you want to use the theorem, you need them to be defined on the whole region enclosed by the curve. Okay, so that's what the theorem says. Now let's, let me uh, start relating this to something we all understand and that's area. Right, so it turns out that we can compute area from Green's theorem. Here, it's a simple observation. Pure, powerful idea though. Right, so the observation is that if, if this thing I'm integrating, so if, uh, qx minus py, if I'm working with a vector field such that the, the, this combination of partials is just the constant function equal to 1, then Green's theorem tells me that the line integral over any closed curve of that vector field is equal to the integral of the function 1 over in the region inside but the integral of one, with the double integral of the function one is just the area inside the curve, right? In this, in this condition over here that uh, q sub x is equal to p sub y, this, this does happen a lot of, I mean, a, a lot of the time. It's, it's not hard to find examples of vector fields with this property. So examples, right, so for example, uh, I could have uh, p comma q to be, so a vector field with qx minus py equal to one, I could have, for example, q to be the function x and p be the function zero, then qx minus, minus p1 would be, um, py would be one, or, or, or I could have p comma q to be, you know, same idea, but in, uh, if I could have q to be zero and p to be negative y, and then I would get the same result. I would so the, the the derivatives appearing in Green's theorem would would add, would, uh, would give me one. Or even still, I could I could combinate these two these two examples. You know, take a uh, half of the first example and add with half of the second example, and then I could and I would still get that qx minus py is one, right? I could so in this case I could take you know a half. So minus y over two comma x over two. So if, if I integrate minus y over q over two dx plus uh, x over two dy over any closed curve, Green's theorem tells me I should get the area of that curve. So what I'd like to do now is to, you know, is to uh, do this in an example, show that, show that this, this really happens in a, in a real example. So let's, let's compute the area of ellipse of an ellipse uh, in the way that Green's theorem tells us uh, that should work. So I'm going to integrate 
this vector field over here over an, e, over an ellipse and we should get, uh, so do a line integral of this vector field over around an ellipse and uh, we're going to get the correct area of the ellipse, just as Green's theorem promises. Let's see that happening. So, um, so example, So for our example, uh, we have the uh, standard ellipse with uh, semi-radii A and B. So uh, ellipse maybe I've got the terminology wrong there, but anyway, I'll just draw it and you know what I mean. So take the standard ellipse um, this one over here and so this, so this is uh, like a circle of radius 1 except that it's stretched by A in the direction of the x-axis and by B in the direction of, of the y-axis. And so because, the, because A and B can be different in general, it could be more oval than it is. Um, it doesn't have to be a circle anymore. So according to Green's theorem, the area of the ellipse is... Uh, of this ellipse is equal to the double to the integral over it over the ellipse of minus well let me just put a factor of a half in front of everything so according to Green's theorem it's the integral of minus y dx plus x dy uh, so if I integrate over the ellipse minus y dx plus x dy and then divide everything by 2 in other words, if I integrate this last vector field over here, which satisfies q sub x minus p sub y equals 1, then I should get the area of the ellipse. Let's see, let's see if that really happens. So here, uh, I'm going to, to, to compute this integral, evaluate this integral, I have to parameterize my ellipse. I'm going to start from the parameterization of the circle, and then I'm going to modify it to uh, satisfy the equation of the ellipse. Right, so here uh, x is going to be something times cosine t, y is going to be something times sine t, and I want that x squared, x over a squared plus b over, uh, y over b squared give me 1. I want that to be true. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to multiply, I'm, you know, this is usually guess and check, but I'm going to give you the correct guess uh, right away. I'm going to multiply uh, cosine by a and sine by b. So this, I'm stretching the a direction by a units and the b direction by a multiple of a factor of b. And then you see that x over a is just cosine, that's squared, plus y over b, that's uh, sine squared. I do indeed get 1 by, by Pythagoras' theorem. And to cover the whole ellipse, of course, I need uh, the parameter t to go between uh, 0 and 2 pi. All right, so let's, let's use this parameterization to compute the integral. So we get, um, let me just give myself some room over here. So I get uh, one half of the integral for t going from zero to two pi of minus y. So for this ellipse, minus y is minus uh, b sine t times dx. Now dx is uh, dx dt times dt. So dt is coming uh, at the end of everything. So let me just put dt back here. Uh, now dx dt is uh, derivative of cosine is minus sine. So I get minus a sine t. And then we add x times dy. So x in our case is a cosine t. And uh, dy is dy dt times dt dy dt is b times cosine t. Okay, so as a result, we're integrating, so we're, so this integral is the integral from 0 to 2 pi of, uh, so the 2 minus signs cancel, and then I'm left with a b, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm getting a b from both factors. Okay, so let me just put the, a, a, bring the a b out. So in the first factor, I have a sine squared, and the, the second factor has a cosine squared times dt. 
And now we just use this below above, but we know that a is sine squared plus cosine squared just simplifies to one for any angle t. And so we're integrating one uh, from zero to two pi. The result is just uh, two pi. And then two pi times a b, that my friends is just pi times a b. Okay, I wish I wish the, the answer didn't get squished as much as it did, but here it is: pi times a times b. So this is exactly the area of the uh, ellipse if you check it on Wikipedia, right? You, we can also check it to something familiar: the area of the circle. We get a circle if a is equal to b, right? If a is equal to b, then then pi times a b is just pi times uh, b squared, right? Pi times the radius squared, that's the correct area for the circle. Uh, and Green's theorem is telling me that, uh, I mean, it's, give, it's giving me this answer from a, from a, uh, Green's theorem made this prediction that the integral, that this line integral would give me the area in every single case, and it did in this particular case. So we should be, this, we should take this as good evidence that the theorem is true. Okay, so in fact, uh, it, it turns out that Green's, that the, um, we can, uh, so this, air, this fact that we can compute area from, from, uh, from, we can corroborate this fact, we can corroborate this, this so this fact that area, that Green's theorem gives us a way to measure areas, gives us another way to corroborate the theorem. Namely, uh, that there, because, there is a mechanical device whose functioning is that we use to compute uh, areas that was historically used to compute areas. Nowadays, there are more sophisticated methods, but you can find that cer certainly find it in uh, museums of science. So there is a mechanical device to compute areas whose function who, that only functions, uh, whose design is based on Green's theorem. Let's 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 look at that. Let's look at that device and uh, now analyze it a little bit. So it's called uh, the planimeter. And uh, we will use the planimeter to measure the area. So biologists would use the planimeter to measure the area of a, uh, of a bird's wing, for example. So what the biologist will do is he'll put the bird's wing on a table. And then, okay, so, and then he will trace out, or she will trace out uh, the bird's wing um, by uh, the tip of a mechanical arm uh, until they go around the whole, the whole, uh, the whole wing, and uh, after they do so, there will they will so on the tip of the arm there there is a little wheel where um, string can can uh, roll around and accumulate, and then after the biologist has gone around. They will just measure how much string accumulated on this on this little wheel, and that number will be, I believe. Uh, let me check my notes. Um, uh, the area divided by by a number that is known by the length of the arm. So let me let me now give you this in slightly slightly more detail. Let's let's draw a, a sample curve here that we're whose that we want to investigate using the planimeter. So we have a curve C. And we want to use the planimeter uh, to, we want to know what's the area inside this curve. And uh, let me now draw uh, the, so the planimeter is, as I briefly mentioned before, is a mechanical device. So it has a fixed point, there is a, it, it consists mo mostly, so mostly of a mechanical arm with two hinges. So there is this, uh, the elbow and the tip. So both of these, uh, so here the, the, uh, so this angle here is unconstrained. So the, these two pieces are metal pieces. They are, the, these rods are not flexible, they're rigid but the angle here between the arm can change. And uh, this point here is fixed, but this angle could change as well. And I can freely move this tip around. I can use, I can just pick it up with my hand and bring it down here. And if I do so, for example, if I bring it here, 
then the then the thing would start to start to move like like this and so this other point will move as well but i can definitely pick this up and move it here move this piece around the plane around a table um and um so let me start giving some names to these things. Let me say this point over here is x times y. And as I mentioned, uh, I just mentioned the elbow of this mechanical arm. Uh, so it has coordinates. The coordinates of this elbow depend on the coordinates of the tip, right? So they're going to be, you know, the first coordinate is going to be some function of x and y, and the second coordinate is going to be some function of x and y. Um, okay. Now, uh, a few things we'll need. So we'll need L, the length, to, to you know, give you the precise, uh, the precise prediction from Green's theorem. Uh, the, the length of the arm is, uh, we're, we're going to call it L. And uh, what Green's theorem tells us is, let me bring this picture to another, to another slide. is that 1 over L times uh, the area inside the curve is equal to uh, an interesting number. So it's the distance uh, that the point that the tip x comma y moves um, in the direction perpendicular to the arm. Perpendicular Okay, so I'm going to so so here's here's what's happening. I'm moving this point x comma y around the curve uh, in the counterclockwise sense. Um, moving it around the curve, and um, I'm not so I'm not measuring simply the distance that I go that 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 this point moves. If I just measured this the distance that the point moves as it goes around the curve, I would just get the length of the curve. Instead, I'm measuring the distance that it moves in the direction perpendicular to the arm. So let me draw that direction over here. So here is the direction perpendicular to the arm. It's going to be a number. Um, uh, n. It's going to be a vector n, and this vector is, you know, perpendicular to the arm. And you see this this vector it changes. If I move this point over here, then uh, the angle, be then then the then the vector n is going to move as well. So I, I should say. So you see that n depends on x and y. Uh, this this is something uh, like a vector field, and it was really a vector field because it's a vector that depends on a position in space. I will leave I will leave the dependency out for now. Um, so I'm measuring the displacement. Um, so the, the the displacement of this vector is of this point as it goes around the curve. This is really uh, this measurement is really eval is a physical way to compute the line integral integral over c of n times dr right so dr so remember what, the, what how line integrals work so dr is the displacement is an infinitesimal displacement on the curve and so it's a vector that uh, connects two nearby points on the curve it's an infinitesimal vector that connects two nearby points on the curve and then uh, I'm not seeing I'm not asking how long is this vector I'm asking what's the um, What's the dot product of this vector with the with this normal direction? Let me change. Let me just include in the notation the fact that the vector n has length uh, one. Okay. So I'm just you know doing the dot product of a little displacement with the normal direction, and that just gives me how much of that displacement went in the normal direction. So this is uh, the mathematical picture. Let's go back to the to the physical to the uh, to the physical situation. 
So the way this line integral is computed uh, physically is that uh, on this mechanical arm, there is a wheel. On the tip, near the tip of this mechanical arm, there is a wheel. And this wheel, uh, so, so this wheel, it, it rotates. If the arm moves sideways, the wheel is going to rotate with the arm. It doesn't slide. But if the arm moves, uh, uh, if, if the tip, if x comma y moves in the direction of the arm, then the wheel slides and it does not rotate. So this, this, this distance in, in, the, in the perpendicular direction is measured by how much this wheel is rotating. You just have to tr keep track of how much it rotates. And a simple way to do that is just to have a string rolling around on this wheel so the wheel can rotate, it can wind or unwind as it goes uh, in one direction or another. All you have to do is at the end of this, of this trajectory, uh, ask, check how much uh, string is wound around uh, the wheel. So, um, so this distance is measured by the wheel. This distance that the point tip moves in the direction perpendicular to the arm is measured by the wheel. Let me just say this which is the same as the line interval, is measured by the wheel. Okay, so, uh, so to, to put everything together, um, so first, uh, so the way that the, mechan the device works is you just move, move a tip, the tip of the arm, around the desired curve. And then you, there, so there is uh, there's a, t a wheel near the tip that you're moving. And on and this wheel is, uh, there's a string that winds around it. So what you do, so after you go around the curve once, you just check how much wheel you find, what's the length of uh, string that you have wound up around your wheel. You, uh, this length is the value of this line integral. So you multiply that by L, that gives you uh, the area of the string. So that's how the planimeter can give you the area of the, the area inside the curve. All right, so the, the, the reason we have this equality here is, uh, is, is Green's theorem. So let's, let's explore that. So, so here's why. So the reason is uh, number one, Green's theorem. Uh, but let me be let me be a little bit more precise than this. So the number two thing is that so this integral over here. So to apply Green's theorem, let me write the integral in component notation. So let's say that this vector field n has components uh, p and q. Um, right. So the line integral n dot dr is the same as the integral over c of pdx plus qdy. Okay, so Green's theorem says that the integral of pdx plus qdy is q sub x is the double integral in the region inside of q sub x minus p sub y. Now, the crucial thing, the engine that makes this, this thing tick is that uh, if, so for this vector field n, q sub x minus p sub y is equal to 1. So if we do a calculation, and this is a calculation, this is like a hard, I mean, a, not hard, but a long calculation. The, just if you get it started, it, it's not that bad, but it takes a little bit of ingenuity to get it started. This is a calculation. Right, we have to precisely state uh, how p and q depend on x and y, uh, and then uh, compute the partials and, and then we'll find one. So I, I won't do all of this, but just let me just see what I can fit on this slide before we change subjects. So here's, let's, let's do a little bit, of, little bit of this work. So first, let me express uh, the vector field, uh, the normal to the arm, you in, in terms of x and y. So the normal to the arm is gonna be so I'm going to take the, the arm has direction uh, x minus a comma y minus b. So uh, to get a normal, I'm going to flip these two and put a minus sign in front of the first component. 
So I'm going to get minus uh, y minus b, and then comma plus x minus a of x y. Okay, so that gives us uh, so that's almost the the normal uh, direction to get a unit vector. Uh, I should divide by the length of uh, of this of of this thing. So this this vector here is the, is is the original is this one, but rotated by ninety degrees. The rotation doesn't affect its length, so the length of the rotated thing is just l. Okay, and now I still need to be able to. Now the mystery is is in a and b. How can I find a and b in terms of x and y, or how can I take, or really what I need is to be able to take their, their partials and how, so to find out that Qx minus Py is one. The way I do this is I just use two facts. I use the fact that uh, first A and B, uh, they live in the circle of radius L around the origin. So here I'm assuming that uh, this, the, the fixed point over here is at the origin. So this, the first part tells me that A squared plus B squared I'll put x's everywhere. A x a of x y squared plus b of x y squared is one, and the second part tells me that this distance over here, the length of the vector x minus a comma y minus b, uh, is is l as well. So that's a. Right, so I have these these two equations. Uh, so this the point is that x comma y lives in this circle of radius L around uh, the, the around the point A B. So these two equations they they they're true for all x and y. So I can take partials of both sides. So on the right hand side is going to give me zero in both cases. So, but then they're gonna, so if I take the x partial here, it's gonna give me uh, relations between the x partials of A and B. Take the y partials here, same, I'll get relations between the y partials of A and B, and similarly down here. And uh, so this way, I'll, this will give me information on the partials of A and B, these two equations, and I can use that information uh, to compute uh, the partials of, of uh, P and Q. And remember, uh, P, is this first component of the normal vector, and Q is the other one. Oh, uh, actually, so so P is, my apologies, P, P is th this this thing, th sorry, P is this thing divided by L, so let me just multiply L over here, and then you get it. All right, uh, to conclude today's lecture, I'd like to give you one more piece of evidence uh, for Green's theorem. Um, so we've, we've already seen how Green's theorem connects with our criterion for conservative fields. We've seen how, uh, how we can go to a museum of science and see a physical object that is a, a testament to the truth of, of Green's theorem, the planimeter. Uh, next time, I, next lecture, I will tell you what I'll interpret uh, with you, uh, Green's theorem in the context of fluid mechanics, and there I think the intuitive meaning of the theorem will be the clearest. But before we get there, to conclude today's lecture, I'd like to show you uh, a mathematical argument for why Green's theorem is true. So I'd like to give you uh, a proof of Green's theorem in a special case. And, and the case is, uh, the case where the region D bounded by the curve is simple from the point of view of integration. So we, we've worked with these, with uh, type one and type two regions before, and uh, I'm gonna assume that our region here is both type one and type two, type two. So proof of the theorem in the case uh, where, uh, where D, the region, is both type one and type two. So I'll recall what, what type 1 and type 2 means. So a type 1 region is a region of the xy plane 
um, that consists, uh, that lies between two graphs. So we look at uh, an interval of the x-axis here, the, I'm looking at, say, the a-b interval, and then I will consider uh, two graphs, uh, the graphs of two functions over this region, something like this, for example. Right here, up here, y is equal to a function, uh, let me see what notation I use in my notes. Um, So up top, I'm going to have the function g2 of x, and at the bottom, I have the function g1 of x. Right, and, and uh, the region D is this region between uh, the, two, the two graphs. So I'll, call, I'll do it in green like this. And I'm, I'm, I'm giving the curve, of course. So C is the boundary curve. So it, has, it goes around the region like this. And it has uh, four components. So in this example, C is uh, C1, the bottom component, plus C2, this vertical component, and C3, which is uh, you know, the, the portion of this, the graph of G2, and then C4, uh, which goes down. Okay, so C1, our curve is, is four components in this case. And uh, I would like to check that uh, the integral of pdx plus qdy um, uh, over over such a region is equal to um, is e is equal to the double integral of q sub x minus p sub y. So here I'm, I'm actually so so I show so this picture here shows what a, what is a type one region. So this is type one. A type 2 region is the same, except that we have an interval on the y-axis, and then a region has to lie between the graphs of two functions of, of y. So x is equal to maybe f1 of y and f2 of y. All right, so let's, let's do this. So we want to check, uh, check an equation. I'm going to check two special cases of the theorem. It turns out if I know those special cases are true, then the theorem in general is true. That'll simplify things. So we have two things to check. The first thing is that if I integrate over this curve, uh, p times dx, so with no q, q is zero here, in this case, uh, I will just get the double integral over the region inside the curve of uh, qx, in this case, is that's, that's zero, minus p sub y. I'll just write it out in full dp dy. And the thing, the second thing, so I'll call this equation star that we have to check. The second equation we have to check is that the integral of q dy over this curve is just the double integral over d of uh, dq dx over the region with respect to area. So I'll call this second equation, equation double star. Right, if I, if I know these two things are true, then I, I add the left-hand sides and the, the answer will be the same as if, if I add the right-hand side. So the integral of p x plus q dy will be the integral of uh, x partial of q minus y partial of p. So we'll be happy. So let's, let's, uh, let's, check, this, let's check this thing. Um, so I'm going to bring this picture with me to the next slide. And uh, let's check, let's use it to check uh, the first equation. So here's the picture. Okay, so we wish to check the first equation. So the integral of pdx, let's see if it's equal to that double integral. So to check the second e equation, we use uh, a, a description of d as a type 2 region. Let's, let's look at the first one. So integral, let's look at the double integral and see what we can do with it. So the double integral we have in equation, so the right-hand side of equation, of the second equation, um, is uh, the double integral over the region uh, of uh, minus db dy times dA. 
Okay, so we, we have a double integral, we have a region. What I'm, what I'm going to do is I'll just set this integral up. Uh, I'll set it up in the order dy dx because it's a type one region and it's easiest to set up integrals over type one regions in, in that order. So x will go from a to b and then y, if I fix an intermediate value of x, y will go from g1 to g2 of x. And then uh, the thing I'm integrating is uh, dp dy um, of x comma y. And then uh, integrate that with respect to dy and then with respect to dx. So I set the integral up. Now I observe the following that I'm not stuck. There is something I can simplify here. Here in, in, inside I'm integrating a derivative with respect to y. So by the fundamental theorem of calculus the result is the, the, the so x is fixed, so p is just, as far as the inside uh, the integral goes, p is, is just a function of y, I'm integrating its derivative. So the result is just p, for that fixed value of x, evaluated at these, the difference of the values of p at these two endpoints. So that's uh, minus, uh, so let's, I guess I'll bring the minus back in. So x go now, goes now from a to b. And then there is minus uh, p evaluated at the, at the top. That's p. Uh, so x was fixed, right? So x is still is, is the fixed value. And then y at the top is g2 of that fixed value. Minus, and then there's the other minus. We get a plus p uh, at uh, g1 at the bottom. Then we integrate that with respect to uh, dx. Okay, so now let's see. We want to we want to say that the right hand side, which is this double integral, was equal to a line integral over around this curve C, uh, and we're kind of getting there, right? So here, uh, let, let's look for example at this at the second portion over here. So he, this second uh, this sec so um, there is the minus sign and something, but the the second term, the integral of p of x comma g one of x dx. That really is an integral over C1, over the bottom piece, right? Do you see? We're using uh, x as our parameter, and then x is increasing from A to B, and then the point x comma G1 of x is moving along this graph, is moving along C1 to the right, and then I'm evaluating uh, P at the, cor at the point corresponding to this parameter, and then I have dx here uh, in terms of the parameter, it's just dx itself. So this is p time, uh, this is the integral of p times dx over c1. The second part is, is this integral. Now on the, no, no, this is good. So we have the integral over the bottom piece. Now how about this part? This part involves g2 and I claim that it's just equal to the integral over, over c3 with the plus sign. So I claim this is uh, plus, and I'll emphasize it's a plus, the integral over, over C3, over the top, of P times dx. Right, this, this term over here, this first term. And, and, and here's why. So, so uh, x, again we have x and g2, so x is increasing in this interval over here from A to B. So x comma g2 is moving along the curve C3, but with the opposite orientation. And so the result, if I just, if I remove this minus sign, the result of this integral would be the integral over minus C3 of P, which is minus the integral of P over C3. But so if I reintroduce the minus sign, uh, that my, the other minus becomes a plus, And so I get the correct number. So finally, uh, I can do, I can add two more things which won't change. Uh, uh, I can add zero to this equation. So here's, here's the zero I'll add. So I can add the integral over C2 um, of PDX and the integral over C4 of PDX. And the equation remains true because these two integrals are equal to zero because DX is equal to zero on C2 and C4, which are vertical.
right? C2 and C4 are vertical, so dx uh, is, is zero on these, on, these, on these curves, right? On C2 and C4, I would use, my, so my, the parameters I would use on C2 and C4 are, would both be y, right? The y, y value, the y coordinate of point on, on, would tell me where I am on C2, right? On C2, I know that x is always equal to b, so if I know y, I know, I know the point. So it's a single number that gives me a position on this curve. That's a natural choice of parameter. And, uh, and dx is equal to zero times dy, uh, and y, so x is equal to b, so dx dy is uh, zero, and y is equal to y, so dx dy dy is just one. In any case, there is no dx on, on these two curves. And so uh, as a result here, um, so we got, we did get indeed, uh, so the sum of these four line integrals is really the integral over C of P times dx, which is, and I'm sorry for squeezing things here, um, this is the left hand side of the equation number one. So the right hand side, so, so the theorem said that the right hand side and the left hand side were the same and I have just checked with you that that is indeed, indeed the case. So I, I treated a very special case. I assumed, uh, I, I, I did the first, the case where q is zero and I assumed that my region was both type one and type two. The assumption that q is zero is not that, not that bad because uh, exactly the same argument will give me the second equation uh, by just looking at the region D as a type, uh, type two region. And uh, for more complicated regions, the solution is to break up the regions into little pieces like rectangles or things that look like curved rectangles, uh, which are type one and type two. And then you prove the theorem for each of these little pieces and you add uh, and you uh, and you add the the results for all of the pieces and and uh, you get the, the the theorem Green's theorem in general. Okay, so this is what I had to say about the proof of the theorem, uh, and um, and what I had to say in today's lecture. So thank you so much for listening, and I'll I'll see you guys next time.